I had just finished working with John on All Fall Down, and uh, he came into the uh, room where we were looping some lines, and he, he slapped this very heavy book on the table, and he said to me, there's your next role. And I didn't know what he was talking about, of course. He said, it's the Manchurian Candidate. It's the best book. It's by Richard Condon, and George Axelrod is going to write the screenplay, and you'll be fabulous as the mother. His enthusiasm was so infectious, I thought, my gosh, this must be something extraordinary. Well, it was, you know. And when I read the role, I thought, I don't know how I'm going to begin to play this, but by gosh, I'm challenged. I have to have, you know, if John thinks I can do it, I'm going to do it. I'm not going home with you, Mother. I'm going to New York. What? I've got a job in a newspaper. Research assistant to Mr. Hoban Gaines. That communist? What could you possibly have in common with that dreadful old man? Well, for one thing, we discovered that we both loathe and despise you and Johnny. I've always had a problem playing just downright rotten women. Chu Chin Chow, or whatever your name is. The steaks are to be broiled for exactly 11 minutes, no more, no less, on each side in a preheated grill at 400 degrees. Anything like that, I, I just can't touch it. But I felt that uh, this woman, her crimes were so sub-level, you don't really know what she did, except she was the head of the Communist Party. There was nothing in it that uh, I could take exception to, to the extent of not playing her. No, I was able to do that, and thank goodness I did. I thought about it very carefully. I had been in Washington. I had met Washington hostesses. As actresses do, I had docketed away certain uh, characteristics of the way they dressed, the way they wore their hair, and simply used all of those bits and bobs of information that I fed into my memory, and that's what I came up with. Nobody tried to age me. It all had to do with the way I carried myself and my general demeanor. Raymond, if we were at war, and you were suddenly to become infatuated with the daughter of a Russian agent, wouldn't you expect me to come to you and object? John was not a method director or particularly involved in the method as a way of uh, encouraging his actors to produce a result. He directed with such passion himself that you couldn't help but be drawn into his web of enthusiasm. And this was a thing that made him such a good director, and people responded to that. He just knew exactly what he wanted. He was so prepared. Mr. Secretary, can you explain the proposed cut in budget? John loved using every trick of the trade. He relished that, and he was such a, a man from television, you know. He, he knew just how to uh, utilize all of that uh, paraphernalia and make it work masterfully. If there are no further questions for the secretary, I think that'll... It was terribly important that we understood that we were in this position in the shop and that the camera was seeing me plus the screen plus other characters. We had to work within that framework and be very careful not to mess it up or, or lean out, you know. And I have here a list of the names of 207 persons who are known by the Secretary of Defense as being members of the Communist Party. What? Who are still, nevertheless, if you had to get your hands How did you get in here in the first place? And I Major, deeply throw that out of here. John, I think, chose to heighten certain characters to possibly take your attention away from something that he was going to spring on you later. Give me a little uh, chucky on the chin, you know, anyway. John recognized the innate humor in the relationship, for instance, between me and James Gregory, who played my husband. It was ridiculous. It was farcical. The way they talked, the way they carried on, the way she carried on. I keep telling you not to think. You're very, very good at a great many things, but thinking, hon, just simply isn't one of them. But this was all part of her cover-up. You remember the scene where we're sitting at the table having lunch? There's just one thing, babe. 
I'd be a lot happier if we could just settle on the number of communists I know there are in the Defense Department. I mean, the, the way you keep changing the figures on me all the time, it, it makes me look like, like some kind of a nut, like, like, like an idiot. Well, you're going to look like an even bigger idiot if you don't get in there and do exactly what you're told. There's a, a bottle of tomato ketchup on the table. And we're talking about, well, how many communists do you think there are <laughs> in, in uh, Congress or the Senate or whatever it was? And we said, well, 57, you know. <laughs> 57 varieties. There are exactly 57 card-carrying members of the Communist Party in the Department of Defense at this time. Senator, Senator Eisman, I'd like to verify that number, sir. People always say, what was it like to work with Frank Sinatra? And I said, I wish I wish I could tell you, because I didn't have a scene with him. In the Defense Department at this time. We did bump into each other once in the cloakroom, taking off our coats in one of the congressional hearings. Major, how many did he say? Major, how many did he say? I was not aware that Frank Sinatra was so responsible for finally getting this movie onto a soundstage and into production. And obviously, there was a lot of uh, shenanigans that went on to get the money together to get the movie made. And I know that Frank wasn't the easiest person for John to work with, but they seemed to have an alliance. I think Frank understood what a tremendous opportunity it was for him to play this role. He knew that his friend John Kennedy adores the book. Frank talked to JFK about the roles, and uh, one of his questions, oddly enough, was, uh, who's playing the mother? <laughs> Sinatra played it absolutely straight. He was a man in desperate emotional trouble who was having a terrible time uh, settling with himself. I thought that Janet and Frank in that scene were simply superb. I thought it was the best work that I ever saw Frank do. He was wonderfully believable. What they were doing, none of us understood. We just simply didn't know. Maryland's a beautiful state. This is Delaware. I know. I was one of the original Chinese workmen who laid the track on this stretch. I didn't really understand it at all. I don't think anybody does. And that's what makes it so intriguing. Are you Arabic? No. Are you Arabic? No. This created an intense mood of suspense. I tell you, there's something phony going on. There's something phony about me, about Raymond Shaw, about the whole Medal of Honor business. You really didn't know who, who anybody was. You didn't know who Henry Silver was, you know. Just like United States Army. And the young woman who played Lawrence Harvey's girlfriend. She was another quantity. Daddy is going to be just thrilled about this. Everybody had a moment of their own. And I think this is what kept the thing popping along with such vigor and interest. Raymond Shaw, please. This is he. Larry was a consummate actor. He was such a fun person and always thought of as this handsome young playboy type that nobody gave him credit for being the classically trained actor that he was. God knows, Ben, I... I'm not lovable. But I loved her. I did love her. I do love her. We saw him in Room at the Top, and then we see him in this, and many, many other roles in which he portrayed uh, very interesting and complex people. So I says to him, please, do me a favor, will you? Why don't you go and take yourself a cab and go up to Central Park and go jump in the lake? <laughs> <laughs> hey, Raymond, hey! When they went to New York, and Larry had to walk into the lake in Central Park. It was like zero temperature. The, they had to break the ice to, to make the water water. And they did manage to do that. And they had frogmen, but he didn't hesitate. He just walked straight down and into the water. He just submerged himself. And it was, believe me, it was terribly, terribly cold. They gave him a pint of, of brandy when he came out, but he didn't hesitate. I mean, that's the kind of gung-ho person he was, and I have to give him full credit for that. They can make me do anything, Ben. 
Kathy. Why is all of this being done? The hell is that in your hand? What have they built you to do? Daddy, what is it? Raymond, no, Raymond, darling! I think we felt we were all in a kind of rather racy territory. We were doing something pretty unique and different. It was just going to turn a few heads, you know. I know you will never entirely comprehend this, Raymond. But you must believe I did not know it would be you. I can't allow for her behavior towards her son. No, I can't. On the one hand, she was going to use him and did in a disgraceful, dreadful way. I served them. I fought for them. I'm on the point of winning for them the greatest foothold they will ever have in this country. And they paid me back by taking your soul away from you. But when it came down to what had happened to him, I think she was devastated. One last step. And then when I take power, they will be pulled down and ground into debt for what they did to you. Frankenheimer really loved that aspect of it. And that's what we talked about a lot during the shooting of it. He didn't make a tremendous amount out of it. He just said, I want you to kiss him on the mouth at the end. I said, OK. I'd already kissed Warren Beatty. <laughs> it didn't all fall down on the mouth. <laughs> so this was nothing new to me. He said, put your hand up to your mouth when you kiss him. So I did that. So that kind of covered it to the extent that you could, you weren't quite sure what they were up to, you know. We knew we were involved in something that was going to, either people were going to buy it or they weren't going to buy it. The film came out with a certain amount of notice and uh, interest on the part of critics, and then JFK was shot. There was a parallel there that you couldn't get away from. It just was. And I, I suppose that's the reason that the film was withdrawn. It was out of circulation for many, many, many years. And came back in 1988 as a revelation to people. The whole generation saw it, who recognized it for what it was. And they absolutely took it to their hearts. And it became the most important piece of work any of us had ever done. Suddenly, John Frankenheimer was recognized. Frank Sinatra was recognized as an actor. I was recognized as an actress who played, you know, one of the most evil women in <laughs> movie history. And uh, I, I had a whole new acceptance from an audience who didn't know who the devil I was. So I have great uh, feelings of fondness for, for the Manchurian Candidate for that reason. It's also one of the 100 AFI pictures to be counted. So thank goodness it was put out again.